Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to say some very informal welcomes to everybody, uh, especially to uh, Sam Fritz and Ian Milligan from the Archives Unleashed project, which is going to be the focus of our conversation today. We also have Nick Rue in the wings, uh, especially for the Q&A. So Sam, Ian and Nick, thank you so much for taking time out of what are undoubtedly very busy schedules to to join us and the community today. Um, the session is going to be recorded. Now I'm just wondering, I, I think I'll start that now. Um, and thank you for the speakers agreeing to that. Uh, I'll monitor the chat as we go along. Uh, Sam will be doing most of the uh, most of the talking today and she's asked us to hold, uh, I'll monitor the chat and we can do some questions at the end. Um, I would just like to do a few acknowledgements here. First and foremost, um, I'm coming to you from the um, traditional territories of the Lekwungen peoples, um, unceded traditional territories out here uh, in Victoria. And a big part of what we're, you know, we focus on at UVic Libraries is this idea of reconciliation. And even though in today's conversation, we might not be addressing specific issues around you know, the colonial past of our institutions and the present and the future. Um, and as we work through those issues, I think, you know, some of the basic fundamental values that inform uh, our conversations around honesty and openness and respectfulness, fairness, generosity, being active listeners, I'd really like to have us reflect on those qualities as we approach um, this really interesting session today and think about the land that we came that we're all on and the institutions that we're working with and how we can bring those qualities into our work. Um, we are very lucky to have Lise from Carl here with us who will be um, uh, able to help us do the conversation is going to be in English, but if you would like to ask questions or chat um, in French, please feel free to do so and Lise will will help us with that. Um, this session is all about the Archives Unleashed project, which doesn't need much of an introduction for most of you in the web archiving community. It is really a global leader in terms of the connection between archives and history and computational analysis and building tools to help people engage uh, research and researchers engage with with web archives and we're going to be uh, talking about this project today and where where it is and where it's going to go and I don't want to take too much away from from Sam so with that I'd like to turn it over to Sam and Ian and and, and Sam and Ian if you could just perhaps both do brief introductions and just let us know. I'd be really interested to know how you how you stumbled across the world of web archives really briefly before we get going. So with that, I'll, I'll mute my microphone and turn it over to uh, Sam and Ian. Thank you very much. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, and thanks to everybody for having us here today. Um, it's nice to see some familiar faces around the virtual table. Um, I'm Sam Fritz, I'm the project manager for the Archives Unleashed team. Um, and in terms of coming to the world of web archiving, um, I'd say I'd probably had a bit of a, an introduction to it uh, during my MLAS studies, um, but it really was a new initiative to jump into, um, but really grateful to be on a team that blends a lot of different skills. Um, and it's been incredible to see just the, the various ways that researchers are starting to engage with uh, web archives in their research. Um, so I'll let Ian um, and Nick introduce themselves as well. Sure, I, I can really quickly just say, um, my name is Ian Milligan. Um, I'm a prof associate professor of history at the University of Waterloo. Um, one of a sort of team of interdisciplinary um, faculty investigators that helped put the grant together and the, and the Archives Leash Project alongside Nick, uh, who's here today from York University Libraries, Jefferson Bailey from the Internet Archive, and uh, Jimmy Lin from Waterloo Computer Science. And it's, it's a sort of bringing together library and history and, um, and computer science perspectives. And then now with the Internet Archive, which I think is, is really cool to try to think about how we can improve access um, to web archives. And, and a lot of this comes out of just you know, an early generation of scholars trying to use work files, trying to figure out how to use web archives and realizing that the tools weren't there. And so we as a group are, are trying to solve that problem. I don't know if, if Nick wants to say hi before we before we turn it back over to Sam. Hey, I'm Nick Ruay. Uh, I'm at York University. 
Sorry for missing you at the, in the beginning there, Nick. Um, thanks for thanks for the introduction. Oh, it's okay. I wasn't. I, I kind of crashed this. <laughs> Great, Sam. Awesome. Um, so keeping in line with the theme of the webinars, uh, as well as the mission for the Canadian Web Archiving Coalition, um, I am going to talk about web archives from the context of the Archives Unleashed project, um, but also from the perspective that this data provides just some incredible research opportunities. So as we, oh, sorry. As we look around um, this virtual table, we have archivists, we have librarians, uh, we have digital preservationists, we have many people from the information profession, um, as well as scholars and researchers from a variety of different disciplines. Um, and as such, we all interact with data, whether it's organizing it, searching for it, providing access to it. Um, but we also use this data to interpret and understand the world around us. And so the launch of the World Wide Web has really shaped this global climate of how we're connecting with one another and how we interact with information. But I think more importantly for this discussion, it also provides this new context for research data. Um, I think it's wild to think that the web has been available now for almost three decades. And in that time, it's become such an, an integral part of our daily lives and perhaps more so because of the pandemic. As of October uh, 2020, there were approximately 4.66 billion internet users, which translates to just under 60% of the world's population. And we can look at some basic statistics uh, to understand just how much data we create. So during 2020, um, every person created 1.7 megabytes of data every second, every day. We also see that there are over 306 billion emails sent per day and over 90 million photos and videos shared to Instagram. And in the past few minutes that I've been talking, approximately 1140 web pages have been created. So with that in mind, with this, I guess, illustration of just how much data we're uh, creating and curating, um, there really can't be any doubt that the web has created a massive shift for research because it's dramatically impacted the way that we're producing, interacting, and preserving information. Um, and I think there's also this collective sigh of relief in knowing that just shortly after the web launched in the early 1990s, there was the foresight and that this conscious effort to ensure the preservation of born digital data through web archiving. And so we saw you know, some of these first large scale projects um, to address preservation initiated by Rooster Kale and the Internet Archive, as well as um, national libraries in Sweden and Australia um, in, in around 1996. As a stat, um, as of today, Archive It Alone has over two petabytes worth of unique data, which is roughly equivalent to about 40 billion records um, from 12,000 different publications, uh, sorry, public collections. And again, this is just data from Archive It. A lot of the institutions that are represented here as well have also been part of that web archiving process. So whether it's been to engage in collections and preservation or to ensure access uh, and support to collections. So on the one hand, the web is now vital, sorry, on the one hand, the, the web res represents this great opportunity to distribute, to present, to share, and to search for information that we incorporate into our research. But on the other, it's also now a vital subject of study. Um, and that's because it's a primary source. So the web becomes a critical, um, piece when we study history post-1990. Um, and it's the web archives themselves that become an access point for exploring uh, our modern historical record. So just to kind of give some examples of uh, some research and some areas um, for research in using web archives, we can look at um, the New Measures Research Project, which was a team led by Philip Napoli and um, Matthew Weber in collaboration with the Internet Archive. 
and they used web archives to assess the nature, um, the needs, and the overall health of journalistic content in local communities throughout the United States. Um, another example of using web archives comes from more of a social history perspective. So we can look at a recent dissertation by Sarah McTavish, um, who is one of our project collaborators. Um, and she ended up using um, and analyzing the GeoCity works uh, to examine the expression of queer identity and community on the early web. And then finally, we can look at an example of using web archives to gain insights into some political discussions. Um, so two of our project uh, investigators, both Nick and Ian, led a multi-institutional multi project called WALK. Um, and basically, they, they developed this platform where you could search for content and graft trends that looked at Canadian uh, political parties and political groups. Um, and this was based off of um, the University of Toronto's uh, collection. Um, and the, the visualization here on the right-hand side um, just shows you kind of what you can use the tool for. Um, but it's interesting to note here that you can start to graph visualizations to help us see at what point um, these political conversations or these different topics start to overlap and uh, diverge. And so the opportunities to engage with digital content and digital cultural uh, heritage in the form of web archives um, has these two significant implications. First, it expands the scope of our study. So we're able to incorporate a wider and more diverse range of voices and perspectives. So thinking back to um, some of our research examples, you know, when we look at uh, Sarah's research with GeoCities, it highlights the ability of us to take web archives and then to start to expand and explore the histories of various marginalized um, and vulnerable groups. In addition, we also see a difference in scale. So we see the shift from resource scarcity to abundance. But as many on this call can probably attest to, um, there are also a lot of really big challenges that pop up at various points in the web archiving life cycle um, and activities. So everything from selection and collection to organization and storage, uh, description and metadata. Um, but I'm gonna focus here on the unique challenges that access and use bring to researchers. And so access remains a significant barrier, largely because the computational access at scale requires an understanding of not only high performance computing, but also familiarity with the command line. We also have scholars that are faced with time, resource, and support inadequacies. And so this is where the Archives Unleashed project come, comes in um, and has really, I think, excelled for the past three and a half years. The project grew out of a series of datathons that were held between 2016 and 2017. Um, and through conversations with participants, um, it was identified that there was a need for um, better analytical tools for a community infrastructure, as well as accessible web archival interfaces. And so in 2017, the project was formalized um, and was awarded a grant from the Andrew Mellon Foundation. And from 2017 to 2020, um, our team has really been focusing in on bridging the gap between researchers and their access to an exp and exploration of web archives at scale. So our work falls into three main categories, accessibility, community building, and sustainability. When we talk about accessibility, um, I think it's kind of good to have a working definition. So we're referring to the ability to make use of something or the capability of being reached, used, understood, appreciated. And so in this light, we've incorporated the spirit of access and accessibility um, in a number of different ways. So first we've provided multiple different access points for exploring web archives through the development of our tools. So the toolkit, the cloud, um, as well as some other experimental approaches. Um, we've also taken great care in creating user uh, 
platforms that are as user friendly as possible, um, as well as creating documentation and resources that support training and learning. Uh, community building has been a really big part of our project um, and also a big goal. Um, we've hosted Datathon events um, as a primary activity and the goal has always been to develop a community of users um, around those tools. Uh, but our team has also participated um, in this larger uh, web archival community uh, through a number of different activities. Um, so through conferences and meetings, but also in collaborating with various institutions uh, and groups. And then sustainability, <laughs> um, which I think is a challenge for any group, any project, um, no matter where you're housed. Um, and so for us, planning has always uh, spoken to kind of this long-term life cycle of the project. Um, and our goal has always been to ensure that the project survives and continues um, once the, the cycle has ended. Um, that's certainly a question that has brought up a lot of other questions, um, but speaking specifically to the development of our tools and platforms, we've kept sustainability in mind by integrating things like widely adopted uh, and stable programming languages, um, as well as best practices. Uh, and again, we've also engaged in a number of different collaborations and partnerships. Um, so understanding that this is kind of a, a larger question, I'll speak to this a little bit more uh, when we chat about the project's next steps. So now I'd like to take a look at the actual tools um, and hopefully you'll be excited as I am to jump into this. Um, I'm gonna speak to both the toolkit uh, and the cloud. We have other, um, I guess, methods and approaches that we've developed, um, but these are the kind of the two main pieces. Um, and, you know, happy to answer any questions um, about these afterwards as well. So the Archives Unleashed Toolkit, um, it's open source uh, and it's a platform for analyzing web archives. It's built on Apache Spark, which is, um, which provides that powerful tool for analytics and data processing. In terms of how it works, the toolkit is launched from terminal. So uh, an example being on the right hand side of the screen here. Um, and in our do uh, documentation, we provide dozens of pre-built scripts that users can then modify uh, and use uh, within this uh, framework to then explore their web archive collections and extract specific information. So there's a lot of different functionality uh, for the toolkit. Um, and I'm just gonna touch briefly on these five here to, get, um, to give you a sense of what you can do with the toolkit. So uh, in terms of collection analytics, we uh, can take a look at quick stats that help provide uh, a snapshot of what the work collection contains. So for example, uh, we can take a look at the top level domains and subdomain frequency. In terms of text analysis, uh, a user can extract all of the text from a web archive and then start to do some text mining by applying uh, various filters. So you can filter by date, by language, by keyword, domain, um, and URL pattern. Um, and again, these are pre-built scripts. So um, just slight modifications and plugging them in. Um, and then similarly uh, to text analysis, we can jump into named entity recognition or NER. And so this is basically a Spark script that uses the Stanford named entity recognizer to extract entities. So persons, organizations, and locations directly from the work files um, or from extracted texts. And then kind of jumping into a different area of analysis, we can take a look at networks. So the toolkit offers this ability to explore hyperlink practice. Um, it extracts web graphs uh, and you can use it to export um, both GraphML and GEXF files, um, which are very handy when you jump over to Gephi. Um, and we can start to take a look at some questions like what websites were the most linked to, um, what websites had the most output links, uh, as well as what communities existed within the link structure. And then finally, binary extraction um, is 
a pretty amazing feature. Um, so the toolkit can be used to explore the distribution of binary content like um, audio, images, videos, and documents like PowerPoint, spreadsheets, and PDFs. So that's the toolkit in a nutshell. Um, and then we jump over to the cloud. And as its name suggests, uh, this is a cloud-based analysis tool. Uh, it supports the priorities of our project um, in terms of accessibility and usability because it provides users with this web-based front end um, to help access the toolkit. The cloud was um, primarily developed by our project co-investigator and developer extraordinaire, uh, Nick Rue. Um, and it has four main components. So it's built on the toolkit code base. It has a Rails backend, and then we have the user interface in front, which is something that we tend to be more comfortable with. Um, and then kind of the glue that brings everything together is the Wasapi data transfer API. And so this is what makes the connection between the platform and the data source. And in this case, that would be a user's archive it uh, collections. In terms of functionality, uh, there are several different outputs to the cloud. Uh, once a collection has been analyzed, the dashboard then provides this area to not only download derivatives, but it also offers some visualizations, which you can see here on the right-hand side. So users have uh, the ability to download five different derivatives. Uh, the first two um, the RA GEXF and GraphML file. Uh, and these can be again used with Gephi software to do a little bit more digging into network analysis. Uh, and then we provide three additional CSV files, um, domains, uh, web page text, and then text by domains. And then finally, below those derivatives, we have the ability to do some in browser visualization. Um, and so we have you know, the crawl frequency, which draws from um, the API. We um, have a hyperlink graph, which um, does have some functionality in terms of zooming in to do a bit of investigative work, but again, um, not a ton of analysis done through this tool. We would, you know, do, be doing the majority of work um, through tools like Gephi. Uh, and then finally at the bottom, we have uh, a domains graph. So we have two tools um, that are very complementary to each other, but when we compare them, there are certainly some, some pros and cons to, to using both. So on the one hand, the toolkit is very powerful. It offers a variety of different filtering solutions. Um, and this is so that a user can really hone in on specific queries um, and it scales very well to large collections. However, um, the, the challenge with the toolkit is that it is still geared towards the advanced user um, and does require familiarity with the command line. The cloud um, harnesses the power of the toolkit because it reduces the need for a command line. Um, it provides uh, this familiarity with a click to results type process. Um, however, the drawbacks to it is that it does become less customizable um, and that users, only users with an archived account will be able to generate the derivatives because we are using um, the Wasapi API as um, the data source. So understanding that we have users with a variety of different experiences when it comes to the technical side of things. Our team developed some additional resources to support, uh, encourage, and empower scholars who are approaching, you know, these new tools and methods for exploring web archives. So first we see the toolkit documentation, um, which is very extensive. Um, it essentially provides documentation in a cookbook approach. Um, so it has pre-built scripts or as we like to refer to them as recipes, um, which you can see in the example here on the right. Um, and basically we can just take that text, uh, tweak it a little bit based on your research question and then plug that in to address some of the common analytical tasks that uh, we've seen with our users. We also provide uh, learning resources. So as we've consulted with our users, we've found that there are many people who 
kind of a, are, are stuck on this question of great, I have these files now, what do I do? <laughs> um, so we've created these learning guides which provide instructions on how to use and explore the derivatives, um, but taking a look at how they interact with external tools like Gephi, um, Antconc, uh, and you know, there, there are tons of different tools that um, they can be used with, uh, but this just provides a, a starting place for scholars. And then finally, uh, data sets. So as we've collaborated with other institutions, um, Nick has worked with, with various groups and um, uh, institutions to process web archive collections through the cloud um, and then make those derivatives a bit available for all to use and explore. Um, and again, this is a great starting point for scholars who, you know, maybe might not have access to a web archive collection, but certainly want to start to learn uh, and engage with this area of research. So if we kind of summarize what our team has been doing um, for this first leg of the grant, um, so from 2017 to 2020, um, we can take a look at three main outcomes. The first was we developed the Archives Unleashed Toolkit. So we've been able to apply modern uh, big data analytics infrastructure to the scholarly analysis of web archives. Second, we've been able to deploy the Archives Unleashed Cloud. So being able to provide that one-stop web-based portal for scholars to ingest their archive collections and then execute a number of analysis with a single click of a mouse. And then finally, uh, in organizing the Archives Unleashed datathons, we've been able to build uh, a cohesive and sustainable user community. Um, and this has allowed our core project team to come together with librarians, archivists, and a variety of other interested researchers from different areas. But one area that still is kind of a question mark and that still needs to be addressed is sustainability. And that's where um, the second phase uh, of our project comes in. So the project um, was awarded a second Andrew Mellon Foundation grant, uh, which will continue uh, and expand our work over the next three years. Uh, so from 2020 to 2023, um, our original team of investigators will be joined by colleagues from the Internet Archive. Uh, and the idea is that we will be integrating and blending the complementary services that each group brings to help broaden access to web archives. So when we talk about merging Archives Unleashed analytical tools and uh, the Internet Archives Archive It services, um, we're looking at two main goals. Um, the first being is that we are merging these services um, to provide an end-to-end -end process for both collecting and then studying web archives. So our team's gonna be starting off by setting up uh, the physical in infrastructure and the computer, uh, the computing environment that's gonna be needed, um, which also includes uh, dedicated infrastructure um, at the Internet Archive. We're then going to be migrating the back end of the Archives Unleashed Cloud as it is right now to archive it, um, but paying special attention to how the cloud can scale to the work um, within this new environment. Um, and then within the stage, we're also gonna see the development of a new user interface. Um, and this is gonna provide a basic set of derivatives to users. And then finally, uh, our team is gonna be incorporating um, consultations with users to uh, then expand um, and enhance derivatives and new features. Our second goal uh, is to engage through mentorship and collaboration. So by building on the earlier successes of our data funds, we're gonna be launching the Archives Unleashed cohort program, uh, which the first one will be starting the summer, this summer uh, in 2021. Uh, and the idea is to engage with and support Web Archives research. So we're gonna have research teams that participate in year long intensive collaborations uh, and in turn will receive mentorship from the team uh, with the intention of producing a full length manuscript. 
So in terms of what we're working on right now, um, our focus is really on integrating our two systems. And so we are building a new user interface. And this is going to blend the Archives Unleashed Cloud with the Archive It space and infrastructure. So we've been doing a lot of wireframe sketching, which has been great. Um, we're also in the middle of conducting some concept design interviews. Um, and our developers, Nick and Helga, have been building out uh, the prototype, which is looking really, really great. Um, and our team is, uh, is really looking forward to sharing that with the community, uh, hopefully in the coming, coming bit. <laughs> um, so that's kind of where we are in terms of our current work. So as we wrap up and just before we jump into questions and discussions, um, I'd really like to encourage you to try out our tools if you haven't had a chance to, um, to share them with colleagues. Uh, and our team really, really hopes that you'll stay connected um, as we enter this second phase. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for, for uh, having us here. Um, and at this point, I think I'm just gonna call um, on our other um, team members, so Ian and Nick, uh, and I guess we can open the floor to questions. That sounds great. Thanks so much, Sam. That's really, yeah, yay. <laughs> well done. Um, that was really, really interesting. So, Sam, can you talk a little bit? Uh, there, there's um, the, the arch archive, it offers sort of researcher services um how will this like is this going to be a tool that uh, the intention is available to anyone who's using archive it yes um so i think the the first stage is really um because it's blending archives unleashed with archive it basically if you have that archive it account um the services are going to be such that those derivatives we were seeing in the cloud um, are now just within uh, and expanded um, within the archive it infrastructure. Um, and then I know our team will also be looking at how to integrate, um, like how to extend that. Um, so thinking about maybe researchers who don't have access, um, how, how can they still conduct web archive research? Yeah, I'm sort of thinking we could potentially. Um, it's a, yeah, like like um, the re, the academic libraries that have access to the infrastructure could potentially partner with researchers to do that work, even if they were from another school or something like that. Um, I have some possibilities there, but. Um, do you want me to jump in a little bit, Sam? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, yeah, Corey. Uh, so if if anybody's for those folks that are familiar with the like archive at universe interface, there's the uh, like the research research services or the what is that button called? I can't remember, but it's it's the button you were referring to where you can run like Watt and Wayne jobs and uh, it's uh, ARS tab. Yeah, the ARS tab. Yeah, um, so the the prototype that we're building actually kind of expands and reworks um, that particular tab. So uh, it'll look different, but like kind of have that same archive at uh, look and feel. Uh, and what we're doing right now is incorporating in all the all the ARS work, but also all of the uh, archive job, or I mean, all the archives unleashed jobs that we run now in the cloud, but also a bunch of the can jobs that we haven't uh, yet included in the cloud. That's like all the binary uh, extraction. Um, and uh, I, think, I think in total, it'll be about 14 jobs. I think you could do it from the, the uh the archives unleashed side and then like the four or five jobs um that are in the ARR side and um just looking at the chat uh yes the, the the idea is around june because uh our deadline is uh around june <laughs> for our uh support from Q compute canada for the current infrastructure and uh requirements to have an archive at account uh, uh get a get a contract with the internet archive for i would say contact go to archive it.org and, and uh work with them yeah actually um the uh justine 
uh, the um, depending on your institutional affiliation, there is um, sort of a consortial Canada national discount for subscribing to archive it. So um, feel free to reach out to me uh, and I can connect you to the right people if you if you're more interested in that you can get it like 30% off um, through the consortium uh, through the discount. Um, there's a question from Dana um, in the q and A. I I always forget that there's a chat and a Q&A, you know, just so many options. Um, the accessibility framing of the project calls to mind W3C accessibility standards and how these might intersect with both the toolkit for users and with applications for it. Uh, possibly a future state question, she asks. Yeah, for sure. I mean, especially since our project right now is at a state where we are creating a new user interface, I think that that's definitely a consideration um, that we need to be integrating as we develop out um, are the are the accessibility standards. This is really exciting stuff. Um, it must be really cool to move. So, <laughs> You're moving from Compute Canada to partnership with Internet Archive. How how's that going? Like, how does it feel to sort of move between those organizations? Talk a little bit about those collaborations. Ian, did you want to jump in? Sure. Um, so Compute Canada's. I mean, those of you familiar with Compute Canada, their cloud service is great. Um, their application process a little ungainly. The CCV is always fun. There's 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 some quibbles and stuff like that, but but we've been successful, I think, in two RPP applications to getting that sort of baseline compute. Um, yeah, and then the migration to we're fortunate in that when we talk about moving our services over to the Internet Archive, we're we're really standing it up from from scratch. Like we're not moving cloud.archives unleash.org to go live at the Internet Archive. Um, but rather doing it there. And actually, I think just this morning, we just learned that our, our dedicated compute infrastructure at the Internet Archive has just been purchased and, and we'll have it installed. And that'll give that sort of first, first round of, of dedicated um, infrastructure there, which is always a challenge for a project like this. So I don't know, Nick, if you want to add anything from the technical point of view on Compute Canada or Internet Archive. Yeah, I mean, the really nice thing is like the 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 big the big data and computing cliche of like getting the compute closer to the data, um, and with the compute Canada set up, um, if, if anybody has run like a large uh, archives and least cloud job uh, from one of their collections, like a multi terabyte job, like we can do it, but a lot of the time and the lag takes from moving uh, like those terabytes from I should say not move, but copying those terabytes from uh, the archive infrastructure to the Compute Canada uh, server that we have actually is sitting on at UVic. So that's where our stuff is hosted. So it's just like moving stuff across uh, the internet, which can be really slow sometime. Um, but being able to run all that stuff there. And I think that the, the other thing to like really, uh, Sam hit on this in her presentation is, is just the sustainability aspect of it. Like, we, when we wrote the first grant, like one of the, the things that we wrote into it was trying to figure out a sustainability plan for this project. And was it spinning up our own corporation and charging folks? And, and there really wasn't much of an appetite for this, but like it, it, all this time and work and labor and effort we've put into um, is going to go somewhere and hopefully live. Uh, and and uh, archive it is probably the best place for it. Um, and I guess in a way that kind of, I can answer that one Q&A question about the, or actually, sorry, I misinterpreted it. I'll let Ian and Sam answer the, uh, the, the cohort question. Yeah, I, I just add to what Nick was saying. I mean, so much of, I mean, the, the size of the data meant that, you know, we'd get, we, we'd quickly fill up our allotment of storage at Compute Canada, um, you know, within a matter of days sometimes when there's heavy use. So you get into this whole workflow when it was like coming from San Francisco, going over the internet to Victoria, we've got 10 terabytes of data, we analyze it, we delete it. And then the user wants to run it again, we have to re-download the 10 terabytes of data. And, and those are the kind of efficiencies um, we'll get when we move it there. And, and I mean, both, both Nick and Sam are bang on that the lament of all many digital humanities projects, really, really exciting, got that grant support, got that you know dedicated compute, and then everybody moves on and it's 
dwindles and dies and three years later it's a 404 error so that's you know 94 percent of web archiving is done through archive it or some some ludicrous some some ludicrous market share from the uh, National Digital Stewardship Alliance survey. So it, it it really is a natural fit. Yeah, that's really great to hear. And uh, you know, it, it just makes me think too as we're thinking of um, digital research infrastructure in Canada and this new organization, Andrio, and and just you know, thinking about how. It, it, it's wonderful that you found a good fit at Archive It, and that's sort of the the competitive um, process for getting compute and the sort of the time limits for uh, major funding through, um, you know, that the CFI and Compute Canada um, has some limitations, I think, for some of these, these projects moving forward. So it's really great that you found a good fit, but I think we also need to think about, well, how can we ensure that as we build out digital research infrastructure in Canada, that folks can can do that if they don't if they're not lucky enough to have a partner like archive it um etc so uh that was just my little bit there but um there's a there's a question from uh christy uh christy hurl who is the cohort program aimed at faculty librarians archivists students all of the above um so i guess i'll take a first spin on this and you know nick if you want to jump in um, so our, our first round of data thons were really about everybody coming together and then creating their teams on the spot and then looking at research. We're kind of taking a different approach with the cohorts in that your team is actually coming to this event. Um, and so the idea is that you already have a data set in mind, you already have sort of a research question in mind in terms of what you'd like to get out of um, the data that you're exploring. So in terms of who it's aimed at, um, I, I think it's pretty open. So all of those um, with the idea that, you know, it is a smaller team. It's, it's in around four to five individuals, um, but certainly a more, the more diverse it is, the more perspectives that are on your team. So I think it's, it's pretty flexible that way. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, as Sam says, flexible, because there are some funds involved, um, and these are the sorts of things we'll be hashing out soon, um, someone on the team has to be sort of eligible at the institution that receives the funds um, to, you know, whatever the institutional rules are around um, administering the grant locally. That, that's the only sort of admin wrinkle in that, but sometimes you see. Sometimes if a faculty member isn't necessarily on the team and others at the institution aren't eligible to receive grant funds and they can find someone to be sort of a figurehead. But in Canada, at least things are, are relatively flexible in our institutions. And in terms of timeline, um, we are looking to start the, um, the call for participation in the next couple of weeks. So uh, for those who are interested, uh, definitely keep your eyes out. Yeah, the, the only thing I would add to that is like the, the cool thing I think about uh, these like little cohorts is with the with the data thons they're kind of like these micro projects that folks get like really good ideas but really they only have like a day and a half 36 hours to like work through this thing and with this you get the more concentrated um experience like you get more time to work on this and you get more um concentrated access with like us who have a lot more experience with the tools and stuff like that so I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to like the back and forth of like working with the tools and getting feedback and improving the tools, uh, but also getting other people like really exposed to the tools. So like in terms of community building, they can go out and, and share uh, their use and the perspective with the tools as well. So it's not just the three or four of us here. Uh, thank you very much, Nick. Um... Uh, perhaps somewhat remiss uh, in the beginning to not have mentioned that um, the Canadian Web Archiving Coalition is supported through the Canadian Association of Research Libraries, that, which provides us a lot of support, obviously, through the Zoom call and um, and things like that. But, you know, I would also like to just sort of say, and Dana, um, who is from Vancouver Island University, has this in the chat. Now, VIU isn't a, a CARL member, um, and the Quack is really meant to be bigger than Carl, but I would just like to echo Dana's um, sentiment there that this is really amazing work that's having um, uh, a real impact on and will continue to have a real impact on our communities, and our researchers. And I think we just all would really like to thank you all for seeing this through and, and making it happen um, and just acknowledging all of your hard work and 
uh, and just being very thankful to, to be able to, to talk with you about this stuff. So thank you very much.